What's up, garden and friends? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. I'm filming in a different location today. Not that different from usual, but I, you know, I don't know how annoying the sound from the pool fountain is going to be. So, hopefully, it's not too bad. Today, I want to talk about the Cordellinis. These are also commonly called Dracania palms. Really, they're Cordellinis. I've always called them Cordellins. Uh, just out of bad habit, really. But uh, you know how I've mentioned going to Missouri Botanical's website before? Well, you can open up Missouri Botanical website on your cell phone or computer, whatever you want to do, and there's a little speaker up here. And when you click it, it pronounces the name of the plant for you. Cordellini Australis. Let's try that back here. Cordellini Australis. So... That's how I double check whether or not I'm pronouncing things right. And as they said, Cordellini australis. These are also commonly called Cordellini indivisa, which they're not. That's a different plant that looks very different. It's, let's get past the naming. Uh, actually, we need to clarify the naming because when you go to look for these plants, they have lots of different names. The green variety back here, the most common ones, often just called spike plants or Juxania spikes or spike palms. Sometimes they're called ponytail palms, even though that is far from what they are. These are definitely not ponytail palms. And then the red variety, sometimes they're called the red cabbage palm. They can be referred to as the Cordellini Australia's red star, which is the actual true name for them. A red star palm, red cabbage palm, uh, red Cordellini. That's just that it's very frustrating when so many common names get mixed in with everything. So I just wanted to go over all of those names just to clarify in case somebody's trying to find these. And I'll have the names in the titles and descriptions as well. Okay, let's talk about the red star first. Cordellini Australis Red Star. These are beautiful. I absolutely love them. They're the red variety of the normal green spike plant. They do not get quite as big. I believe they average about 8 to 10 feet with these guys. And you're going to be seeing uh, zones 9 to 11 is what most everything on the internet is going to say. I would think, honestly, all of these should be fine in zone 8, and I will talk about that later. But the red does seem to be a little bit more cold sensitive than some of the others are. Through This is all through my experience growing them, at least. One of the things that's really nice about the red variety is that they add a nice structure. All of these plants are great plants to put in the center of your pots in flower arrangements. You can put them in the back of your garden and they add a structure. They draw the eye back. And so this is another reason that I absolutely love them. They're great plants. They're super easy to grow. I'm going to go over the other varieties first before I start talking too much about how to grow them. Next over here, these are just the green variety. They're just the plain old Cordellini. Australia's. I love them. They're normally sold as tiny little, just little plants to stick in the middle of your pots, and they just look like grass. They're common. I'm sure just about everybody has seen these before. But what's cool about these is if you stick them in your garden, they will actually grow into a really tall, cool-looking plant, depending on where you live. I'm in zone 6B, and I have had them come back for me from uh, rough winters from the roots, but you just end up with those little grass blades that you can pick up for like a buck fifty from the nursery. So I don't really know how much it's worth the effort unless you really want to construct something elaborate to help preserve the trunk. Now, I do recall back in, uh, oh goodness, probably the late 90s and early 2000s, I would go out to Seattle very often to visit family members, and these guys were all over the place. And they weren't just growing in the center of pots, they were growing in people's gardens, very, very large. Meaning that these are much more hardy than Zone 9. Uh, Seattle, depending on the area and the, you know, the proximity to Puget Sound and whatnot, generally 7B and 8A is what you were looking at back then. It, back then it also didn't really snow very much there. Now, you know, it snows all the time. So, you know, things have changed. But back then it was Zone 7B and this is before they even redid the maps. And they were growing very well there. So uh, all the websites saying that the green variety is only good as an evergreen in zones 9 and up, I'm going to say no, that's not true. Yeah, I, but to be safe, maybe 8A. That, that, should, that should be safe for you. These guys, the, uh, uh, the green variety, get, I believe, 12 to 15 feet tall. 
yeah, 12 to 15 feet tall. So a little bit larger, but as far as the height is concerned with these guys, it's not, it doesn't really matter unless you're looking for a single trunked plant. When they get too tall, you just cut them whatever height you want and they'll branch out from where you cut them. And then those will continue to grow. So you should make your cut lower than the height you want your plant. And then lastly, this little gem right here is a, a variegated variety called the Torby. Torby Dazzler. The tag's kind of far away, but I'm pretty sure that's what that says. And it's the same thing. Quartal in Australia is just variegated. These plants come in such a huge variety. The hybridization of them is immense. It's fantastic. All the different colors there are. There are some varieties that are like practically neon orange and just like rainbow, just rainbows and rainbows of colors. So these are just the three that I have, the three different varieties I have. As far as care goes, all of these need full sun to part sun. You could probably get away with them in the shade, but they're not going to grow as fast. They're going to be longer and more leggy. You're not going to get a really thick, succulent, full trunk on them. So the more sun, the better. I would say probably a good five hours minimum. Then as far as the cold tolerance go, for the green variety, I really do think you're probably safe in zone 7B and 8A, with, you know, variations being taken into mind. But, you know, have it near a, oh, having them near walls helps a lot, south side facing walls and whatnot, good mulching and good drainage and all of those things. Nice, moist, fertile soil, and they have very deep roots. So once it goes in the ground, it might take you quite some time to get it out if you change your mind about it. One of the things that's so great about these guys is the versatility. Like I said, they do need well-drained soil, fertile soil. You're going to get the best growth out of them. You're going to get a really nice, thick, healthy-looking plant. But you can also slightly xyroscape with these. Not a true xyroscape because they're going to need irrigation. Uh, and if you're going to try and use them as a drought-tolerant plant, then they should probably not be getting, you know, 8 to 10 hours of absolutely scorching sun on top of gravel. You might notice these are all looking kind of shabby. Well, the red ones were on clearance, and I think those are actually looking better than the other ones that I've been holding on to for a little while. I went ahead and I left them looking shabby so that we can talk about pest diseases, pruning, and care. And I'll go ahead and clean them up in the video, or at least partially clean them up, that is. So, if you're growing these indoors and outdoors, but particularly indoors, you need to keep in mind that these are very, very, very prone to spider mites and mealybugs. And oh my goodness, do mealybugs love chewing on these guys. They get down inside all these little crevices on the undersides of the leaves. I battled mealybugs with these green guys back here, and uh, I have since had them in an area of my garden that gets a lot of sun, a lot of airflow and I just sort of left them in their nursery pots for this year. I'm going to go ahead and repot them soon though because they're too big for their nursery pots now and keeping them watered will just be a nightmare. So that's why they're a little bit straggly looking because they're still in recovery mode and I've just kind of been letting the bugs get out of them. A lot of the time nature helps. It's depending on your infestation, birds and things will get them. Otherwise I have been spraying them with mixtures of I'll spray them with rubbing alcohol, uh, with some soap, and then peppermint oil works well, neem oil. There are lots of different things you can do, but with mealybugs, I always like to apply alcohol, a diluted alcohol, 70%, preferably first, because it helps desiccate the waxy coating on the mealybugs so that whatever insecticide you use can really penetrate down in there and get them out. It's going to be giving me some trouble focusing here because of the variation in the branching. You can kind of see how the trunks develop on these guys. And to prune them, you just come in here and you just go ahead and snap these guys off. Get all the scragglies out. I'm not taking very much out. So see how thin that is? It really shouldn't have very much taken out. And if you give them direct sun, you're much more likely to have a nice straight trunk on these as well. And yeah, never go too high while you're doing this because you can end up snapping the entire head off. And then vertical growth for that main trunk is done. Once this comes off, it'll just branch out pups from the side. And those will grow like crazy. See how pretty this variegated variety is? One of the things I really like about this variegated variety is it gives a very similar appearance to a, just a regular Drixania marginata, the, you know, the variegated Drixania. But it should be more cold hardy. I haven't tested that, so I can't speak to it, but since it is of the bloodlines, of the regular quarter in Australia should be a little bit more tough than just the regular marginatas. And the more sun you give them, the better that, that red color in the center is going to be. 
and that red color is going to be more prolific when temperatures, nighttime temperatures are starting to cool. So this is just starting to pink up as our nighttime temperatures here are starting to drop. Now this Torpy Dazzler, the text is 15 to 18 feet tall on it, which is the actual height I should have said for the regular quarter in Australia. It's 15 to 18 feet tall, it's possible. And you can see here, even though it's probably not in focus, that the leaves go all the way from the base all the way up. They'll hold on to their leaves for a very, very long time. The only reason I've gone ahead and cleaned up the trunk on this one is because you can see in here where the nursery had cut a bunch of its leaves out. So it had this bare patch in it and it was bothering me. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to leave the leaves on the trunks of the other guys. And it just had this giant gap in the middle that just didn't look right. And you can even see where it's brown in here, where somebody had already pulled leaves from the center. I don't know why they would do that, but they did. So, also, if you're holding it, pulled down to the base where it has a woody stem. So I went ahead and got that cleaned up. Any white that's left on the trunk there will eventually turn brownish gray and be more of a woody stem fairly soon. That's going to do it for today. I hope everybody's doing well. This is just a very brief overview of a very, very, very common plant. But sometimes it's fun to just reiterate some basic knowledge. Don't forget to like and subscribe. All that fun stuff down below if you already haven't. I try and upload multiple times a week. Just follow me on Snapchat. Trop Plant Party. Two peas. Three peas. Trop Plant Party. Peas or net. Anyways, again, hope everybody's doing well. Don't forget, keep on growing. Bye-bye.